वेलकम स्टूडेंट्स सो दिस इज़ द सेकेंड एंड द लास्ट क्लास ऑफ द लास्ट वीडियो दैट आई अपलोड रिगार्डिंग द असाइनमेंट एंड दिस इज़ द लास्ट पार्ट ऑफ द लेसन ऑन अमेरिकन हिस्ट्री दैट आई हैव बिन गिवन यू सो आई होप दैट यू हैव वॉच एंड गॉन थ्रू द प्रीवियस वीडियो बिकॉज दिस विल बी अ डिडेक्ट कंटिन्यूएशन फ्रॉम दैट सो आई सेड आई हैड सेड दैट आई वुड बी beginning uh, i will be talking a more talking more about the racial contexts uh, of america and the racial situation in in the country in the continents that is so uh, <clears throat> let's begin with that in the last class we saw how america was developing uh, you know technologically industrially socially so even after even as it grew politically and economically it continued to be a racist society after the 1890s that is the late 19th century early 20th century the conditions they worsened because the conditions particularly of the blacks it worsened as racism increased in the south legislations were evolved that kept them from from the vote that disallowed them from voting and involved brutal methods of punishment chastising chastising them for everything including false rape charges or other misdemeanors that were often wrongly attributed to the blacks we will see how many literature how the literature uh, of the time represented these these problems state and municipal legislations they segregated they created a difference a distinction uh, between the races and these segregated or distinctive laws you know particularly objected towards the blacks they were known as the jim crow laws so let us talk a bit about the jim crow laws a very important part of the culture uh, in which many of the generations of blacks grew in and uh, uh, which uh, langston hughes had to face as well so the jim crow laws they were particularly segregating laws aimed at curbing or obstructing any social uh, uh, rights economic rights to the blacks so when the reconstruction began uh, in about 1867 uh, the, the blacks they were allowed to vote and they held uh, many you know official positions and government positions so it lasted the reconstruction lasted for a decade for 10 years and after the 1877 when the reconstruction ended the people who supported slavery uh, the people who supported institutionalized safe slavery they created tighter a tighter atmosphere for the blacks to breathe in when they closed in on them racially and they enacted this jim crow law you know, which included what was called grandfather clauses so the grandfather clause it essentially means that it essentially means that if the grandfather of this particular black person was eligible to vote before 1867 that is before the reconstruction period began then uh, this particular black person would also be allowed to vote this was the reconstruction era so 
before this 1867 it was but natural that most of the people most of the black people they were enslaved they were uh, you know they were slaves and they did not hold any voting rights so as a result this grandfather clauses they meant that the blacks cannot vote at all so after the reconstruction this notion of being separate but equal you know this came to be an example of which you could see on your screen you can see on your screen you can read the definition caption of the picture that is also see the picture very nicely you can see that uh, there is a water vending machine for the colored and uh, another one for and there would be another one for the white men that is the white people that is <coughs> so this would be this could be seen everywhere you know, you know the separate separate but equal so uh, they were they started agitating the blacks they started protesting and they demanded their right to vote and uh, they demanded their right to hold official positions important employment positions that is so as a result what happened uh, in, in, instead of you know kicking them out of the entire system entirely at one go uh, what the whites did was that what the power holders they did was that they created they gave these blacks very import very 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 difficult legal tests legal tests to crack and gave the white people easier tests to crack therefore you know restricting their opportunities you know, nipping it but nipping at the bud that is nipping the opportunity at the bud and not letting them participate in that employment opportunity at all so oh, that, those were what the uh, jim crow laws were uh, then communities communities of the of that time the segregated railroads uh, so this is this is the term that you would want to use this is just a moment so this is the word that you would want to use segregation so the jim crow laws were essentially a method or means to means to this segregation to this to the segregated community so the communities they segregated railroads uh, they segregated street cars schools steamboats restrooms drinking fountains the one picture that you saw uh, and other public facilities and enacted ordinances requiring separate neighborhoods even so the official end of slavery had obviously not made much difference to the way the white race perceived others perceived the blacks that is others who were different especially those they had treated as less than human from the start of their relationship with them so in a in a in a country where senators uh, opine that the negro suffrage that is the negro endeavor to acquire the right to vote it 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 was one of the according to the senator it was one of the biggest obstruction to progress of the country and in the country where the president says theodore roosevelt that is uh, theodore roosevelt in 1906 wrote to a correspondent and i'm quoting now as to the negroes i entirely agree with you that as a race and in mass they are altogether inferior to the whites so there was a vocal there was a vocal uh disparative attitude there was a vocal racist attitude among the top top political position holders uh, you know from the, from where the laws came out from where the ordinances amendments and the bills came out so the the, the racism was uh, not hidden it was an open secret and uh, <coughs> there were even movies came out uh, which <coughs> openly advertised uh, for participating or registering into the triple k or the ku klux klan so and the most of these racist violence the most severe forms of racist violence was 
lynching. We all know what lynching is. It's burning of a person alive. So it was lynching and it was more very much common in the south. And though sometimes whites were victims, the majority of targets were from other races. So there were two incidents occurring every week. Uh, mobs burned victims alive sometimes. And uh, in one of the stories of one such story of uh, e extreme racial violence would be in 1921. A vicious a group burned a black male. And the onlookers, that is the people who were around surrounding the incident, the event, who watched the event, they waited for the fire to subside and they scrambled uh, for the man's bones, which they took home as souvenirs. And uh, even Harper Lee in, in, in her novel, To Kill a mocking bird which came out in 1960 uh, in this novel she presents a moving account of the treatment of blacks but with the complexity of race relations at the time through the story of a white lawyer who defends the young black man accused of raping a white woman and of his two young children who are caught in the midst of this adult cruelty and their father's compassion and understanding of race as a human issue. Even uh, Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, which came out in 1952 by Ralph Ellison, that is, it is a response to many of these racial conditions which were which existed in America the great migration something that we spoke of uh, in the in the last class the great migration of blacks from south to the north which had actually begun during the civil war and the competition for jobs and housing in the cities, they resulted in another form of violence, the race riots. The race riots, which had two communities clashing with each other. The riots broke out in Illinois, Washington, D.C., Chicago. The Chicago riot was in, spite, uh, in, in, in fact sparked off by the whites throwing a stone at a black youth who had, while swimming, crossed a dividing line between the white and the black sessions of the beaches. So the, even, the beach was divided, right, segregated. So the boy drowned, initiating a race war that went for a week and it left 23 whites and 25 blacks dead. So following the official end of slavery, a new kind of, a new kind of system that perpetrated or maintained these segregations uh, the system was to provide labor was devised people who are marginalized you know, on the edge marginalized that is you know, made marginal due to some profiteering factors of those who are in positions of power so people who are marginalized they usually become the man force or the manpower uh, in, 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 in the social structure, in the social scheme of things, in the economical structure that is. So this was peonage. A form of involuntary servitude. It was a form of, peonage was an involuntary form of servitude that prevailed particularly in the cotton belt and in the railroad construction camps, the sawmills and the mines of the south. It began in 19th century, 
Peonage continued well into the 20th. Peons were usually blacks who were made to sign contracts for work and residence by planters. And unsuspecting immigrants who were lured to these work, work sites with hope of jobs. Armed guards ensured that the peons stayed put in the work site. And in cases where peons escaped, they were hunted down with bloodhounds and whipped and chained. Food and shelter was minimal with locked and barred stockades. Converted, they, they lived in converted chicken coops and horse stalls serving as shelters in off, off work hours. In the railroad camps, peons were kept in locked boxcars without cots or even straw. They were just thrown in like cattle. So along with the blacks, along with this, this peonage, along with the Jim Crow law, laws, the Native Americans also faced uh, a lot of objectification. And the Native Americans, they faced a different kind of discrimination. The laws periodically passed by the federal government, they added on to the the feeling of enmity faced by them from individual white citizens. There was a strong effort to eliminate the, the presence of Native Americans by squeezing them, by pocketing them uh, into smaller and smaller areas. And uh, it seemed that as though they were being exterminated yeah. gradually. So there was a combination of government policy and social hostility. You know, as the government tried to assimilate or appropriate the Native Americans. They tried to make them their objects of study and to convert them into the culture that the white Americans practiced. So if open hostility and animosity towards Native Americans was a kind of you know, bodily response, physical response, aculturization or bringing them into, bringing the Native Americans into the so-called superior white American culture and forced adoption of white ways was one of the more systematic efforts you know, to deal with the uh, to deal with the difference, to deal with the difference with these, uh, which these, which these Native Americans represented, to deal with the difference that the white society had to face every time it looked at a native, and this was sought to be achieved primarily. This was sought to be achieved primarily through education. So if you remember our first semester classes, I think, or um, no, 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 I did not teach you uh, that part. I'm sorry, just scratch that. So um, education. So education is also a means of creating, a, you know, education is a means, sometimes a means of ideological control. Not sometimes, it is a means of a, a ideological control it depends upon the person who is using if it the upon the person's distinction to use it in that manner so education can be used to create a false consciousness whereby whereby your own adaptability or your own responses or responsiveness to a particular object around you that object can be anything another person of a different religion of a different culture a book that uh, that belongs to a different language to a different race so an object can be anything so it is the effort to change or to appropriate or to make your relation to any object favorable 
to power but not to you so that is false consciousness it's ideology this is called ideology we will talk about it later on in the next semester perhaps so uh, as i was saying the native children they were taken from their homes and put into boarding schools where their cultural distinctiveness was systematically removed so this is what we will call appropriation or assimilation more correctly appropriation systematically removed as in without forcing you into accepting something that does not belong to you something that you simply do not want something that is not yours so without physically forcing you into it into liking that into being that object which i in power want you to be no into not being different into being more like me so that i am more comfortable in your presence so that i am not reminded of the difference that you stand for of the heterogeneity that you stand for it might be for several reasons it might be and because of national interest because power thinks that including or appropriating native americans will add to their national power uh, will will inculcate a nationality among them nationality as a sentiment you know of love for america as it was becoming as it was being made by the white whites who thought themselves and only themselves to be the superior race among all of these other people among all of these races that were different from them the blacks the italians the native americans all of these people the arabs who were migrating to america because of its because of its glowing and uh, you know, over uh, growing economy because it provided jobs because it provided food it provided an opportunity it provided that very hollow idea of that american dream which attracted all of these immigrants from all over the world so the cultural differences of the native americans they were being systematically removed through education you know their long hair was cut short they were forbidden to speak in their native languages or perform their tribal dances and ceremonies they were forced to drink milk which uh, which they were intolerant of genetically and uh, they could not tolerate it which it led to many stomach disorders uh, and tb tuberculosis from infected dairy cattle those who remained on the reservations you know they lived in absolutely abysmal conditions absolutely poor conditions uh, they were stricken with poverty whole families crowded into single roomed single room shacks with no plumbing no heat and they were frequently on the verge of starvation and one advantage that came out of this that is assimilation that which included you no know, removing of differences and as such if children or people from belonging to different tribes they were brought under single educational institutions as a result so this was the only advantage and when they came together in boarding schools there were connections were established and the indians by the indians across tribes and uh, you know emergence of men and women like carlos montezuma gertrude bronin they expressed the condition of their people to public view and began the process through which a counter narrative of protest developed against the federal government which eventually compelled the government to pass laws to rectify their mistakes and address the native problems and discriminations against them the history of native americans in the idea of america had long been one of systematic incarceration so they were slowly being systematically being removed out of the geographical trajectory of what americanness or what america consists of america is constitutive of and they found found no place in the way white america imagined the nation they were thereby kept separate from the mainstream society and had little presence in the urban or rural spaces of america other races they were not they did not escape from this racial prejudices as well the italians you know they were uh, attacked 
vociferated, uh, you know, stereotyped, attacked falsely. So particularly two uh, particular, le particular legal cases which brought to the for forefront the plight and the fight, uh, you know, of these races. Uh, I will talk about one. In 19, sorry. In 1931, the Scottsboro case. Which the Scottsboro case it represented you know, the racial bias in the justice system, especially in the South. So the incident had nine black youths who were accused and found guilty of the rape of two white women on a train. Eventually, five of the accused were released, but four went to prison. A poem, I'm going to show you a poem. A communication to Nancy Conrad by K. Boyle, which is a direct treatment of this incident. So if you can read uh, the poem on your own, we'll see how it is related to it. So this poem is a direct response to it and it opened a lot of literary you know, reactions to the incident as well. The incident, the event itself, the Scottsboro case was itself very important because it created a chink in the armor of American justice system. You know, as trials went on, you know, what was realized was how shallow and uh, you know, scattered with holes the American justice system was and uh, if you can I will I will suggest you to watch this movie the trial of Chicago 7 if you watch it you will know what uh, why I'm asking you to watch it so this poem was a very important development in literary phase. This brought a very important uh, literary phase in the American racial scene. So if you look at how the poem ends, it sends the pathos of the scene very brightly. So this is set down for the others, that is the poem begins that this is not a poem for the abandoned. Uh, so the poem is addressed to whom? This is set down for the others. People who go and come, open a door and pass through it, walk in the streets with the shops lit, loitering, lingering, gazing, so very common and ordinary people. This is for two men riding, Deputy Sheriff Sandlin, Deputy Sheriff Blackhawk, with Aussie power, handcuffed, 12 miles out of Kalman, they shot him through the head. So along with this, other literary works such as Richard Wright's Native Son, which came to be in 1940, William Faulkner's
intruder in the dust which came in 1948 and uh, we have we have already mentioned Harper Lee's to kill a mockingbird so these are other literary representations of the racial condition representations which transformed this treatment of blacks under the American justice system and it made it into a very important uh, literary theme or a trope and several stereotypes emerged in this climate feeding on the existing and very long held prejudices. The Anglo-Saxon majority in the American racial stock meant that except for those of Northern European origin, all others including the Southern and the Eastern Europeans who came as immigrants, blacks and Native Americans, they were viewed through, through the lens of these prejudices. And these immigrants, they were seen to be the cause of unemployment, crowding, disease and crime in the cities. A perception that the 19th century origins, when that had 19th century origins, when for the first time immigrants began to crowd into urban areas and were feared as the carriers of germs that caused the periodic epidemics of that century. <clears throat> But at the same time, they were also required to form the major workforce for this huge machinery that America was machine that America was becoming. And now was the time to the time came when all of these differences, you know, they were used to the advantage of the people who represented these differences. They started asserting their difference. The changing dynamics of social coexistence, that the official you know, acceptance of the Native American and the African African American into a composite notion of America, you know, the fact that they would be accepted into this composite, or the totalizing totalized notion that was of America, it brought with it many problems as well. very naturally because of how they had been overtly exploited inhumanly inhumanly exploited in the past the official willingness to accommodate and make democratic rights of education and equality available it naturally recalled recalled the abuses of the past and the, and the new threats to the indigenous cultures. The difference must be that the wide, the wider white society that is now formed the readership. Now they were the readers for works that ventilated, that vented out old but unforgotten historical events. And the interest in other cultures that was developed and sustained by the modernist thought that propagated that you know, that was injected in uh, during this particular century the early 20th century that is the mid early 20th century that is so it was also useful for the study and preservation of native cultures so anthropology you know the process of anthropology or learning about the culture learning about men the discipline of anthropology was useful for creating an awareness and pushing for preservation against transformation. So, preservation against transformation. A debate that we can very much apply to the condition in our own country right now. Equally important is the writing by blacks coming out of the new 
Negro movement. So you can do a quick Wikipedia study on the new Negro movement. It's readily available and uh, do that. So it, this movement is representative as a measuring scale of the political and social disadvantages from which their race, that is the Negro race, had been suffering from the very beginning of continued racial violence. It was a representative of continued racial violence as well as of the new opportunities opening up as they migrated to the cities of the north and took advantage of college and university education. So the new Negro movement became the representative barometer, the measuring scale beside which there was put the political, social disadvantages that the race had to face since the very beginning of the past, the continued racial prejudices that still existed and the pondering and an acceptance of new opportunities, future opportunities. They were accepted as they made use of the newfound availability of education, higher education, college education, university education. And all of this was done not without, all of this was done with the memory of the past still inscribed in the consciousness of the race of this particular race of people so the ideological transformation did not actually work upon the negroes uh, the negroes they created a counter culture out of it so you can uh, you can you can watch another movie uh, judas and the black messiah now this deals with the black panther movement just to get an idea a very good idea of the culture of the harlem renaissance that was being uh, that, that that came up during malcolm x and this time particularly the new negro came out in 1925 a collection of writings that came out of a special issue of the magazine called survey graphic um, and it was edited by sorry It was edited by Alain Locke. He's also known as pioneering the Harlem Renaissance. So he declared, and this is, this declared, the new Negro declared uh, that it was to put on record a new consciousness and show the place of black culture in the picture of America. And his, he, Locke managed to position himself at the forefront of one of the most significant and important artistic rebirths in the American history and that is the Harlem Renaissance. 
A new Negro was groundbreaking in its present in its presentation of Negro art, which was thoroughly self-expressive. You now, some of these points are very, very they are vehemently applicable to Langston Hughes's work as well. So, um, Negro art. self-expressive self-expressive it has to be self-expressive because it cannot be expressive in association because what is it going to associate to what is it going to associate to except for the trauma and the memory of the abuse that the negroes carry with itself so it has to be self-expressive as to that is how they related to that trauma the experience of each being different yet being beautifully unified uh, strangely unified by violence so the self expressive of the individual artist this is the important point of the individual artist and not merely representative of culture or society or social responsibilities. And the importance of this book was that prior to the period of individual expression, characteristic of this Harlem Renaissance. According to Locke, Negro art had the primary function to represent a type of Negroes that was socially acceptable and laudably ideal. So if you watch, if you read Uncle Tom's Cabin, if you read Mark Twain's books, if you read uh, Uncle Berry Finn, that is you will find how the Negro is constantly being schematized or made a trope of someone who is a little simple in the head and always subservient and always accepting and always bowing down in front of the white master. Acceptance of the white master's mastery, acceptance of the white master's superiority. So hitherto the black type had always been represented as this. The aim of much Negro art was to advance presentations of the Negro as civilized, cultured and capable of making a worthwhile presentation, contribution to the American society. And it would be against the acceptance and the promotion of Negro stereotypes, of Negro caricatures. Its constant duty was to react against negative portrayals and stifling social pressures. It was an attempt, a very, very important and a very, very significant attempt to make out of Negro life and experience something worthy of respect, of honor and emulation. And Locke says, for generations in the mind of America, the Negro has been more of a formula than a human being, a something to be argued about, condemned, defended, to be kept down in his place, helped up, to be worried with, worried over, harassed, patronized, a social bogey or a social burden. And as opposed to these stereotyp stereotypifications, what he promoted was so what he thought was promoted through this kind of representation of Negroes was Sorry, ghettoization.
in dealing with this specialized subject matter of social uplift negro aesthetic segregates itself from the broader american social context you now when they are concentrated in little groups or coops lock says that we are separated then they are separated then they are re removed voluntarily from the wider american front wider american social context and fails to achieve universal human appeal art at its best on locke's view is not propaganda so art is not propaganda art is not a tool to create the stepping stones for certain privileged groups to rise to power it is not a propaganda it is not promoting of political interests and though there were there may be some initial phase lock would according to lock some initial phase in which art is forced to perform such a function that is not the ultimate goal art does do that but it is not the ultimate goal of art and he says and i'm quoting until recently lacking self understanding we have almost we have been almost as much of a problem to ourselves as we are still to others yet as the thinking few know as that self understanding is achieved and worked into artistic expression the result is that in the reaction the vital inner grip of prejudice has been broken so the the very significant and the most important point of the new negro sent into set into motion was the attitude of the young negro artist to racial segregation how he or she felt as an individual that was the more important thing rather than a wish or a desire prime the primary wish or the primary desire to be included within the broader american culture that would be the result but before the expression of how the expression of the relation the expression of the traumatic relation the relational existence between the past and how the negro saw it how the negro was placed into it that was necessary to be it was necessary for that to be represented first that was what his point was and along with him along with him sorry along with the editor alain lock there were other contributors uh, to the in in the book w e b du bois langston hughes county cullen now these are all very very important names when it comes to harlem renaissance claude mckay jean tuma and another word very important one zora neil hurston the first part of the book was called the negro renaissance and the second part was called the new negro in a new world the two parts of the book to the names themselves they speak a lot about the content the first part it dealt with 
or contained essays on African American culture and poetry, fiction, and drama. And the second part was more with more general, uh, with essays on social issues affecting the Afri African American and on Harlem Renaissance. The biggest figure to come out of this Harlem Renaissance was, in fact, Langston Hughes. wrote poetry, collections being The Weary Blues, which came out in 1926, and Harlem, the collection, the collection that is, which came out in 1942. Novels, essays, compilations of black folklore. He articulated black aspirations and a distinctive black culture Sorry. and also asserted, opined in aspirations and in, in works that carried the sentiment represented in the poem which we read together, I too sing America. I have sent a copy of the poem to you. The place of the Negro in the larger American nation sent to eat in the kitchen. He promises that one day he will eat at the table, that they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. Quoting lines, the Negro speaks of rivers, another poem that I have sent to you, we have read together, mentioned it, sums up this sentiment and shows the social qualities of the Negro imagination, of a soul deep like the rivers. work there is this sense of African Americans as a distinctive culturally rich people whose roots go back to the ancient past and he writes in one of his essays the Negro artist And the racial mountain. One of his essays, he writes and I quote, to my mind it is the duty of the Negro artist to change through the force of his art that old whispering, I want to be white. And I quote again, why should I want to be white? I am a Negro and beautiful. And he uses definition in his essay of, in his essay, in this essay of jazz, the quintessential expression of the African American spirit and one that he used so often in his poetry. He tells as much about the tragic history of his people as of their response in laughter, irony and sadness. And I'm quoting but jazz to me is one of the inherent expressions of Negro life in America. The eternal tom-tom beating in the Negro soul. The tom-tom of revolt against the weariness in a white world. A world of subway terrains and work, work, work. The tom-tom of joy and laughter and pain swallowed in a smile. So that is how we come to Langston Hughes through a enduring study of the American history. So alongside him there was Richard Wright, native son of work that I mentioned before. Ralph Ellison's The Invisible Man.
and the dis the successful articulation of discrimination is a striking aspect of this writing of all of these writings of the people that i mentioned from outright discrimination and racist violence to the more subtle ways in which the psyche the consciousness of the people are affected and therefore du bois w e b du bois writes about double consciousness you know the contest between the wanting to be white to be inclusive within that superiority of race or to be a distinctive identity in all alongside with hughes's critique of black desire to write and think like the whites is as important in this evaluation as when ellison recognized that an alternative or parallel life is lived by the blacks so with that i will end this history of american social literary or his the socio historical context of course if you have any questions for me be uh, come up with them and i will be more than happy to answer thank you very much